I used to love to listen to Casey Kasem on the radio every week and get the, the top 40 charts. And when I found out that Billboard magazine had the charts come out in Manhattan eight days before Casey Kasem said it on the radio, <laughs> I went down to the village every Saturday as literally as a 12 and 13 year old to buy Billboard to get the charts. At 12 years old, you were buying Billboard. I literally, literally was. And, and that was an expensive thing to buy back then. It was, it was. And I, um, my teachers used to tell me in, in high school to put Billboard away. I used to read it in class. So I, anyway, I got into the, to the business side of, of music. I certainly couldn't play or anything else. Um, so your classmates are reading comic books and Mad Magazine, and you're reading Billboard. Um, I'm reading record charts, yes. Um, I was at, I was for for time there I uh, I definitely knew the top forty and 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 every label and every artist on every label and all the trivia and, and all that stuff which got me nowhere but it was it it, it it's your passion set me it set me in the right direction um, in high school I worked at record company at a record company called Private Stock um, in college uh, let's talk, talk about who was on Private Stock some of the artists. Private Stock, uh, they were only around for five years, but uh, a claim to fame for them, they had a number one single every year for their five years, which uh, many labels couldn't uh, claim. But they had, they had people like Frankie Valli, uh, Walter Murphy, uh, Fifth of Beethoven, an instrumental song, um, Samantha Sang, uh, Bee Gees uh, produced top, top song. Um, the problem was with Private Stock that they were very singles oriented, didn't really know the album game and the business was changing and they really didn't change with it. We had the first Blondie album on Private Stock, Robert Gordon on Private Stock, but never, uh, Benny, never got Benny to the, and Benny, the original Sy Benny Ordonez. Sy Syracuse resident. Very true, yes. The first album was uh, on Private Stock and I, I still have some vinyl, some Benny vinyl. <laughs> So, okay, so you graduate high school and you decide to go to college, obviously, and you get accepted at Syracuse University. I went to Syracuse my first week at Syracuse, uh, fall of 1978. Within seven days of each other, uh, Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen separately played the War Memorial in Syracuse. And I said, college is going to be really cool. Um, that, was, that was a great first week. In fact, it was tough to beat musically at those two for uh, over seven days. But then you, you got involved in college in music. I did. I got involved with, uh, with Concert Board. Um, and we grew from doing shows in clubs and theaters and to when I was there, we did the first show at the Carrier Dome, um, which was Santana. And that was a lot of fun. It was, uh, it was a great time. And it was a good... I took courses with Professor Marco, Dr. Marconi, professor at the time, and uh, right out of college, I got a job in the mailroom of ICM, International Creative Management, um, where I literally pushed a mail cart around the office, delivering mail to everyone, uh, which was okay if it lasted only for a short time. and and. It was my, I was out to make sure that it was only for a short time. <laughs> I mean, I did get to know the company and it was good. I, I was very focused in music, but being in a large talent agency, I got to see all different aspects of the business and TVs, movies, uh, literary, the commercial department. And you know, certain people who were in the mailroom with me actually found other passions. You know, they thought they were into the literary department, but found their passions were in the movie department. As they were delivering mail, they got to know the company. I stuck with music. Um, but what got me out of the mailroom, and uh, tip, tip number one for you, is to find a niche, to find a way that you could make a difference. And at ICM, everyone, all the, there are really two jobs at a talent agency. There's an agent and an assistant to an agent. And all the assistants got to go to lunch at 1 o'clock. And one day, the head of the music department said, you know, we get too many calls during, like, for the 1 to 2 o'clock hour. You can't just all run out at 1 o'clock. So half you go to lunch at 1 o'clock and half you go to lunch at 2 o'clock. That kind of pissed off the assistants because the assistants from all the other departments, they got to go to lunch at 1 o'clock. So some people couldn't go till 2. 
I was in the mailroom just a couple months, and there were six assistance desks all in a line. And I said to the assistants, you know what? You guys all go to lunch at one o'clock, I'll watch your desk for you. And I watched six desks for one hour and answered everyone's phone for one hour. Now the agents didn't always go out to lunch because they were too busy, they were, you know, so I was answering their phone and working with them. And sure enough, the first assistant's job that opened up, they were like, who's that guy who answers the phone at lunch? You know, let's, let's give him a shot to be an assistant. So after almost six months in the middle, which seemed like an eternity, I became an assistant. So the moral is like, <clears throat> if you are in a company, and the moral is you create your job. Don't wait for somebody to give you a job, create a job. And, it, and that's what you really did. I think more so now than then even. Right. Um, you know, I believe right now it is much harder for you guys to go out there and find a weekly paycheck. I'm not saying it's not out there. I mean, in this business, I'm saying. Um, it's, there, it is out there, but it's much harder than it used to be. The flip side of that is that the potential for you guys to make money and so much more money is out there and you know waiting for the right person to come up with the right ideas and then implement them. But it's the opportunities weren't necessarily there. There was a much more structured uh, business when I was just getting out of school, which was better if you could get a job. But now the potential is much much greater. So uh, when you when you graduated. Um, the idea was to take a resume and get as many meetings as you can with the uh, record HR companies, agency. Yes, yes. Do a resume. That doesn't today. That just doesn't fly. That doesn't make sense. I, I always say the opportunities are enormous because you have the majors, and in particular the record company side, as with the agencies, there's a merger and consolidation, and there's fewer opportunities within those environments. Now you could go there with the, to the HR with a resume in hand, but my thing is. You should go find some band or an artist, build something, invent something, develop something. If one of these big companies is going to want to steal from you or buy from you or hire you to run for them. So the entrepreneurial opportunities are amazing out there. And as the consolidation continues, there's more opportunities for boutiques as we're getting to where you're working now started as a, as a boutique originally. And on the other side, you know, whether it's publishing or management or record company, nothing preventing you from hanging out a shingle and doing it yourself. And there's opportunities there, and you can do things yourself. Um, one of the uh, alum from here, Rob Fasari, I mean, he, that's how he started. He just decided to do it himself. So I think those opportunities are there. And while it's discouraging to go try the traditional route and go to the HR department and find a job in a major, and if that's what you want to do, that's OK, because there probably are ways to still get into the mailroom or entry level positions. But I encourage everybody to be and put on their entrepreneurial spirit. So let's go back to the mailroom and answer the phones. Yeah. Well, I, I, did, I uh, got promoted after six months. I became an assistant to the uh, youngest <coughs> agent, to the club agent, and was there for a few months. And then got promoted to a theater agent. Then got promoted to the arena agent. Got promoted to the head of the department. Uh, one thing led to another. I went to uh, the William Morris Agency, became uh, an assistant to the uh, to the head of the whole music department uh, for another six months or so. How much money were you making when you got the assistant first assistant job? Uh, I want to say two hundred fifty dollars a week, I believe. Um, and it took a long time for that to go, you know, then it was going up 10 bucks uh, a, t a raise. Now, now Adam, the, the, the importance of um, networking and relationships, because it still always has, it is and always has been a relationship business. So the, the, one of the first people you worked for was uh, in charge of booking dates for clubs. That was, um, I believe, the guy you were working for was a fellow named Jeff Kramer. Yes. And Jeff Kramer today, handles two, well, he handles three acts. Two of them are very tiny. Maybe you've heard of them. Um, one is a guy named Bob Dylan. The other one is a guy named Paul Simon. And recently, he's now managing the Cars reunion. And that was your first job working and for Donald this guy. And Donald Fagan. And, oh, and, and, oh, he's back with now Donald. I believe. Yeah. Donald Fagan from Steely Dan. Yes. So that was your one of your first bosses. That was my first boss. We were booking, uh, gosh, bands like... Uh, Gang of Four, uh, I don't even remember, a bunch of stuff. And then 
kept moving up over uh, from uh, clubs to uh, theaters to arenas to the head of the music department at uh, William Morris. And after about six months of that, I finally did get promoted um, to, uh, to being an agent. Uh, the person who I worked for originally at uh, William Morris, Dennis Arfa, left, formed his own company called QBQ in 1986. Uh, asked me to join him, and I've been with him ever since. And QB no, that was called a a a QBQ G became AGI, same company, but uh, yeah. And that was, uh, at the time, that was a pretty bold move for Dennis to leave a big established agency and strike out on his own. It was, uh, it was, but uh, some of the, it's tough working for a big corporate uh, environment, and uh, there was, you know, our artists, we really, um, Billy Joel was one of them, and uh, Roddy Dangerfield was one, and they, we were really, we were doing everything on our own anyway. We, in fact, were so insular, we, we kept our clients, we didn't even let the other agents deal with our clients. We booked everything ourselves, and our, our artists wanted it that way, so. <clears throat> so how, how did you make the transition from your first uh, place of employment, ICM, to William Morris? That was, they were really the same. At the time, they were the two titans, and... Um, well, you just get up one morning going, okay, I'm going to go across the No, street. I heard that there was this opportunity to work for the head of the whole music department, um, which was a step up from what I was doing at ICM, um, and I chose to, uh, to take that jump, and it uh, worked out, it worked out good. That, that person was Dennis Arfa, so, and he had Billy Joel at the time, and, uh, and we grew from there. When he left to, to form uh, QEQ, he, he knew he was going to bring Rodney and... Yeah, we, everyone who we represented, we represented the Beach Boys, Billy, Rodney, they all came with us immediately. And did they, did they have contracts that they broke or were they coming up? No, they uh, either their contracts were running out or they chose not to sign their last contract. You know, there aren't that many in the agency side, there aren't that many contracts anymore and it's, and it's a good thing frankly, because if someone doesn't want to work with me, I don't want to work with them, and vice versa. I mean, you know, you know, if it's working or not, and my clients, they've been, most of them have been with me for 20, 30 years because of the relationship I have, and, and you know, sometimes artists get a new manager, things change, relationships change, but generally you do a good job for your client, and you're rewarded by keeping them. They see that. It's also hard to enforce service agreements. I mean, you know, what are you gonna just say? You get, you gotta let me book you. The deal, the deal is, you know, service agreements require people to remedy uh, to perform <coughs> certain services. And what do you do? Uh, sue them? Say, well, you know, you have to let me book you. I mean, if there's no chemistry, um, it just doesn't work. I mean, I know a lot of managers don't have uh, agreements anymore. I mean, I think those kinds of contracts between artists and agents and artists and managers sort of. The difference also for, for the music side, for concert side, each show is an individual deal, is an individual contract, and once that's cut off, it's very, it's a, there's a very fine line on, on when you know, I'm, I stop booking shows. Whereas a, a movie agent, for example, a Hollywood agent, could do a movie deal, and that is one deal that pays for 10 years, and you're fighting over how the money's being divided. For a concert, you know, Monday's concert goes here, Tuesday's concert goes there, it's easy to figure out. So when you were, you know, starting as an agent, you know, William Morris, ICM, obviously the business was radically different. And back then there were a lot of, a lot of promoters everywhere, and there was no, there was no divine organization. Um, there were obviously, obviously preferred guys that you had relationships with over the years, whether it was a club owner or the, the local promoter in town. And there was a lot of healthy competition. Um, you want to talk a little bit about how it was back in the Wild West before there was all this consolidation? Well, you had to find people in each town or each city that you trusted uh, to take care of your artists when they were on the road. They had to, first of all, you wanted to make sure that you got paid. That was number one, paramount. Um, is my artist going to get paid? Making sure you get your money in advance and deposits. And, and once the artist is in that town, will they be able to properly promote the artist? You know, we supply everything 
uh, to a local promoter. I don't want a local promoter to create an ad for my artist on based on what they think the artist wants. I want them to place the ad that my artist wants. For example, uh, years ago I represented uh, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts and for many years. And Joan, although her biggest hit is I Love Rock and Roll, her, she did not want to be necessarily known by that song and people would create their own radio spot. If you love rock and roll, come see Joan Jett. Was, no, no, no. That was the worst thing that, that Joan wanted to hear in a, in a spot. So we made our own spots and sent them to everyone you know, to make sure that Joan was presented in each city the way that Joan wanted to be presented. So that was, that's very important. But that was when you could control because if somebody didn't want to play ball and say, well, I want to use my spot, you know, I'm going to get... I wouldn't use them. I mean, they have to play. They have, if they want to represent an artist, you know, they have to do it the way... But you, have, you had options as opposed to maybe today where there may not be as many options. Yeah, um, you know, I, I know where you're going with this with, with, the, with the consolidation of the business and the big companies now, but there still are uh, options, but maybe not options that are going to pay you the money that you want. Um, you know, and that's, that's, you know, there's a, there's a balance between art and commerce. Um, yes, I want what's right for my artist. Um, at the same time, I want to make them the most money. And if I could marry the two together, that's ultimately what I'm trying to do. So <clears throat> back then, if you were representing an artist, you could route a tour and you could figure out where you wanted to go. You could regionalize things or, or do a national tour. As opposed, it seems today, um, there's more of an emphasis we're going to do a, a tour and it's going to cover the whole country. Well, yeah, when I route a tour, generally, generally still I route the tour. And then, because I know where the artist should play for various reasons, uh, whether we do well in a certain market or not, or whether we played the market on the last tour, or how long of a, the cycle's been since we've last been in a city, or what venue we last played, or we stepping up from a certain size capacity to a larger capacity, all these considerations. So I generally route the tour, I generally hold the buildings, then I'll go find the promoters to do the shows. People who see things the way I want them to be seen. I'm not saying I won't listen to a local promoter and, and their input, but I generally know what I want to do and I generally know how I want, how I want my artist, where I want my artist presented and how I want my artist presented. And that's, that's what makes you you and different from a lot of other people. You have to be hands-on. I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm dealing with people's lives. These are real, these aren't, these aren't products, these are people. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, right, so tell the of people you're representing now. Oh, yeah. That's true. We haven't talked about that. So, so currently, at the company AGI, you personally are handling... I mean, I personally represent Metallica. I represent Rush, I represent Def Leppard, I represent Motley Crue, I represent Poison. Um, I work with Billy Joel, I work with Rod Stewart, Linkin Park, um, Meatloaf, Yes. Um, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of classic rock, but some, some newer stuff too. Like you, have, you have paper tongues. Yes, great new bands. And red jumpsuit. Yes. And Red and Saving Able. And Hollywood Undead. And 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 Yes. And then you deal with some non-traditional stuff, for example, uh, Jim Norton, the comedian. Yes. So, um, and then up and coming, like uh, Alexa Ray, who's... Uh, who's uh, Alexa Ray Joel, Billy's daughter. Um, we've been working with her for three, four years now. She's terrific. Um, you know, she's going to break in a different way um, than her dad wrote, for example. She's the type of artist that's going to... She's going to break from a theme song. She's going to break from a commercial. She's going to break from, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a, di she's, a hit single is not how she's going to break these, in, in this current environment. Well, now, it's interesting you say it's going to be different because I maintain in the current environment, used to be an artist put out a record ran it up the radio stations, got it on the charts, sold a lot of copies of their album, cassette, CD, whatever it was. And then there was an audience, a demand was created, and they would come to somebody such as yourself and say, look, we got two big hits on the radio, can you help us route a tour? And then if they were lucky enough, 
maybe um, somebody on Madison Avenue perhaps might want to use their song in a movie, in a TV show, or goodness, in a commercial, to make some real money. But now, that's upside down. As radio has evolved with consolidation, there's less interest in taking chances. One of the most difficult things right now is for a new artist to go out there and get radio airplay, so much so to a significant level that it matters, where it's going to hit a critical audience. A critical but another mass. difference is that 25, 30, 40 years ago, when I was in school, everyone in this room, virtually the only way you heard new music was through the radio. Right. Now you have so many, I mean, you guys probably don't even listen to the radio. and, and you know, or you listen to internet radio, other other you know, avenues, or, or satellite radio. I mean, it's not just over. The, it's that's a, that's a small fraction now. That's not if you you can have a big hit on on terrestrial radio, and and I'm not going to hear it. I don't listen to terrestrial radio. Well, <coughs> the, the the fragmentation, as you as you refer to it, is um, is really what has splintered. So, getting a critical mass of an audience or numbers, kind of doesn't work using the mass media. Um, and the opportunities are fewer and fewer because radio programmers have no longer any incentive to take chances in, on new artists. For an artist like Alexa Ray, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. So, so an artist's revenue stream where the, the sold music, CD, vinyl, whatever it was, was the, was the cash cow that everything was built on that, is now upside down or it's different. And now, bands, musicians, artists, it's much more efficient, and you may disagree with this, for them to start building a base of an audience by touring, whether it's regionally or otherwise. So I think regionally, yes, but regionally, yes, but getting, on, getting a van and going around the country now, I think, is a complete waste of time, I mean, certainly a complete waste of money. You know, I, I encourage young artists to start regionally, and when I mean regionally, I mean locally, and start you know, play within 10 miles of your home, then play within 20 miles, then play 50 miles, and just keep going out and out. And when people want to see you, don't pull into a town and expect people to show up to see you. I mean, why, just because you sent the record or the CD or the link or whatever to a radio station two weeks ago, doesn't mean they're going to promote it. Doesn't mean you, you, you pull into an Iowa city on a Tuesday night and you walk into a club and no one's there. Of course no one's there. You know, go, go there when, when there's a reason for you to be there, when people want you there. You know, and, and so I think start local and just branch out slowly, slowly until there's a reason. You know, it might take you from from Wayne, New Jersey, it may take you six months, a year or more to get to Boston or get to Washington on the other side, but just keep keep doing it and you'll get there. You know, if if you're good enough. Yeah, I, I mean I think you all are familiar with bands dispatch, which have next to no airplay and yet they sold out the garden. Um, they almost caused a near riot up in, in Boston. Um, there's, there's bands like that are doing it without radio airplay and it's built on the back of touring. And what you're talking about is how a new band might start is building out from, from a, a regional thing, starting local and just keep expanding. You know, uh, I mean, you know, I guess the Grateful Dead were the prime proponents of, of touring without trying to get any sort of other media involved and that if they came along and I guess years later they had maybe a hit with Shades of Grey um, it was almost like an accident after the, after the fact so um, I think radio airplay has no longer has the it still has the impact and significance but get, obtaining it is almost like the holy grail right so now an artist really <coughs> needs to have you know and when MTV was actually playing videos probably right before most of you were born, um, that was a way of really exposing new music and getting it around. That was after radio sort of gave up the ghost, and then MTV came, and then radio said, ooh, we better get involved with this process. Now that that, you know, the visual component of it is, is so fragmented between all the internet websites, and, you know, even MTV splintered off with the hive now, where, you know, we'll start our videos, and then maybe they graduate. So the opportunities are so, f are so few and far between, it's fragmented. Um, again, but it could grow fast, it can grow locally fast. And that's, I mean, like most of the new bands that you guys hear about are from yourselves, are from friends telling other friends. You know, that, everyone heard, if a friend told me about a song when I was growing up, it was only because they heard it on the radio before right. I did. You know, then I went home that afternoon and I heard it too. 
Um, so it's just it, it could it could start so much faster from a local perspective. So then, so then here's the question. So you as an agent, what's your incentive to take a local band from Wayne, New Jersey, and work with them and build help build them up? Because you're absolutely not, nothing. Right. You're you're on a you're on a commission basis. I I have to pay the mortgage. So, okay, so the catch-22 is, okay, so you can't get radio, it doesn't make sense to build a video, except maybe virally, um, no one's going to give you a publishing deal because you have no following, so I'm a new artist and I want to get started, so I come knocking on your door. No, you don't, you, you oh, start, I don't knock on your door. No, you don't knock on my door. You start working locally and you start building a reason for, to, to, to use me. You start, you start building a reason. I can't... Uh, a, a national or international agent can't book locally. I don't know, not only because I don't know the local clubs. Um, I know the clubs that play national artists, you know, around the country, but not the local clubs. And, and uh, a young band needs local clubs, real local, real. I mean, you know, it's okay if you play in front of ten people and build it up, and the next week play in front of twenty, and play in front of forty. So, so Adam, so I'm a, I'm a local band. I want to play. Uh, in Montclair at the Meat Locker. How do I do that? Well, I'm just going to pick up the phone and call the guy, the guy and say, hey, uh, I, I'm, I'm Steve Leeds. I no, want to play. That's where the opportunity comes in for you guys. For you guys to find an artist locally that you're passionate about. You go to these clubs and find one of these artists and say, hey, I'll make the calls for you. I'll be, let me be your manager. Let me be your booking agent. And find young talent and, and grow with it and you pick up the you know pick up the aquarium and whatever local papers and see all the clubs and yeah and, and start calling them and get a Rolodex going and and find figuring out people's names and email addresses and start sending them stuff and try to book this the band that you see try to book a couple shows for them and develop a relationship and don't worry I mean the money comes it takes a while but one thing leads to another but just build slowly but that's exactly an opportunity for guys for people like yourself guys and girls like yourself who want to be on the business side. Um, to find a local band and help them grow, and get to a point where I where I'm calling you, where I notice it, and I'm I like, hey, I want to get in on this. So, so when it's the time is right, you're gonna you're gonna smell it and and go chase it. Yes. So, <clears throat> I'm not saying I won't get to a point where you might want to approach me, but you need to have something behind you first, besides just being good, thinking you're good. Show me you're good. Show me that you can bring a couple hundred people into a room. Any question there? Yeah. Um, okay. So I see that that's an that's an actually an opportunity for you. I think that you're already this big agent, so why not have like a subsidiary of your agency that works specifically with small bands employing co upcoming future agents? Um, like a, minor a farm team. team. Yeah. Well, we we have discussed that. It's. Um, it is so local and so regional that I mean there are local booking agents. I don't I yeah. don't know who they are, and and it's easy to you know you can establish yourself quickly if if you are aggressive and eager. Um, but it's a really it's a different it's a different thing. For example, is there are different booking agencies and that specialize in different kinds of music. For example, um, there's an agency uh, ICM Artists which uh, books classical music. Um, I don't know anything about classical music. I don't know, you know, I don't know who books classical venues. I don't know classical artists. I don't know what they're worth. I wouldn't know how much to charge for tickets. I wouldn't know anywhere to, where to play them. Different people do that. There are different agents that book, um, that book, uh, for example, disco clubs and, and late night, um, you know, two in the morning track. That, that book track artists. I don't do that. I, it's just a different business. I don't happen to know. Um, there are people. I don't know country. I don't know the country business. Um, they play a lot of the same venues that rock artists do, uh, but it's a different promoters, it's different, uh, different ways to market, different radio stations certainly, different newspapers. Um, I don't really, uh, I don't know if I would excel to helping develop a country artist. Um, Not hip hop. And hip hop either, I, I don't know hip hop. Uh, they're, they're, hip, they're hip hop promoters, they're hip hop venues I'm personally not familiar with. Uh, so you need to find those people, and just like they're all specialized, new emerging artists are also specialized. So that's why I really have trouble doing it. Um, and people often come to me, oh, come on, just help me out, just help me out. I'm really not helping, because I'm not getting you into the places that you should be playing. You know, um, it might be cool if, you know, if I 
like beg someone, oh, I'll get you first of five, you know, I'll get you on at seven o'clock at some show at Irving Plaza. That does nothing for you. You'd be better playing around here 10 times than you would be being the first of some, you know, in a club in the city. So, in deference to this question, so the opportunity to become a local agent, if you will, for the a regional area, just hang out a shingle and say, okay, I'm gonna become an agent, isn't there some sort of... No, you gotta be moved by it. Find someone, I mean, don't just like pick the first band you see, someone that, that is gonna make you wanna get up in the morning and pick up the phone and, and do it. And there's no restrictions, I mean, I can just do that, I don't have to be licensed? To, no. No? No. So, there's an opportunity for any of you out there who are entrepreneurial, it seems to be a wide open business. I would think uh, lots of opportunities. Anyone else have any questions raised at this point? Nope. So, um, reading uh, <laughs> of all things in the Economist, that um, that the um, the um, live music revenue um, in uh, North America or America was less than one billion dollars in 1995, and this article uh, quotes in the year 2009. It's a, it was a 4.6 billion business. And uh, the question is now, um, with what's going on in the economy, et cetera, that maybe that number has, has slid and there's a, there's a pause in um, the growth of uh, live music. Now, I asked you earlier how many of you had gone to any live music um, endeavors, uh, or performances in the last 30 days, and quite a few of you have. So, um, I wondered if you could speak to, and I know this is a hot button with a lot of people, but um, the, the cost of doing business to go on the road and put together a show versus what the consumer is being asked to pay for tickets. And we'll get into all the other side impact effects of that with the, the add-ons and stuff, but are, are musicians today being compensated for their live performances uh, in a greater way than they were when you first started? Uh, probably. It probably means I'm doing a good job, I guess. Uh, at least my artists would think so. But I, I take some, I don't know if they're unpopular views on some of these subjects. Uh, for example, I believe that an artist should be paid as much as a ticket's worth. Uh, just as in so many other businesses, tickets are valued at what they're worth to the p person buying it. You know, uh, when you're on an airplane, you have no idea what the person sitting next to you is paying. Right. Um, and things like in hotel rooms, you have no idea what the room next to you, you know, you could be paying double, triple. Uh, I believe that uh, t concert tickets were undervalued for many, many years. Broadway shows were much more expensive than a rock show. And frankly, I'd r much rather see most rock bands than most, most Broadway shows. I thought uh, that, it, that it's finally reaching a level now um, with a much more level playing field with StubHub and places like that where the actual value for the ticket um, comes to the surface. And I'd rather that my artist get paid that difference than a scalper get that money. But it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be a fair, equitable way <coughs> of determining that because no matter what the promoter sets the price at for tickets, there's always going to be some other guy who's going to put aside some tickets that he's going to somehow get and charge more. And there's always some, there's always somebody out there who's willing to pay more for that ticket. Possibly. I mean, one, one thing we've done, for example, lately, the past few years, are ticket auctions. And that is to take uh, a couple hundred of the best seats in the house and just have, a, have an auction. And market rate prevails. Whoever wants to pay whatever, you know, there's, there's a start and an end date for the auction. Um, and you know, a hundred dollar ticket might go for two, three, four hundred dollars, whatever the person values those tickets, and they know exactly what ticket they're buying. So, you know, there are ways to determine the value of a ticket. But also to answer your question um, about making money on the road, obviously the costs of touring now are more than ever before, and you guys know it when you go to fill up your gas tank. I mean, when you're driving 500 miles, when you have, you know, you two, when they're on tour, they have 60 trucks on the road. 60. They're driving 500 miles a couple times a week between shows. You know how much that costs? <laughs> it's astronomical. Well, sometimes they, sometimes astronomical. they have two crews 
So yeah. while one's setting up, the other one's going. So there might be yeah. double. Yeah, and it's 60, and you know, 60 trucks, when they get to a venue, they have to feed just 60 truck drivers. Forget about <laughs> everyone else involved. Just, just tr that's, that's 60 meals just for truck drivers. It's huge, it's massive. So it's very expensive to go on the road. To answer that part of the question. But the talent fees have also gone up, and that's, I guess, a function, as you said, you were doing your job. Um, but then so has everything else, the cost of living. Yeah, yeah. I mean, has, has, has gone up. So the accusations have been made that now what has happened with the consolidation, um, essentially, basically, the, the, the live music industry falls under the two umbrellas, either it's AEG or, or Live Nation, with a smattering of, you know, renegade guys out there who are going against the grain and saying, I'm not going to play that corporate game. So, um, with these two entities now taking control of the bulk of the business, I guess we should go back to the fact that um, there was a point in time um, where that wasn't the case, and there was a, a fellow, um, uh, Bob Sillerman, who actually um, was smart enough to roll up and put all the radio stations together under the umbrella of Clear Channel. Um, he did this. He thought he could do this, pull the same thing off um, in the concert business. And so what he did was he approached all the, because I guess there was a time when there was a network of guys who you could go to. There was, a, you know, there was a guy who was based in D.C. There was a guy in Boston. There were one or two guys here in New York, and and you knew as the agent who would be open to it, who could do the best deal. Well, the the. The real, the real trailblazer uh, was an agent named Frank Barcelona, uh, premier talent, um, just a little before my time, but he uh, represented uh, a lot of the major uh, arena rock bands um, of the 70s, the early 70s, and developed a network of trusted promoters around the country that later became uh, the circuit that was bought up by Bob Silliman and, and, and SFX at the time. Um, but it was really this guy, Frank Barcelona, who, you know, who found, you know, the people, helped develop the people like Bill Graham in San Francisco and Ron Delsner in New York and other promoters like that. So, he, he Silliman under the banner SFX, which morphed into Clear Channel, would go to each of these promoters and say, I, I want to buy your business. And he would offer them a formula where he would pay them X amount of dollars and a participation if certain you know, um, goals were met along the way. And it was a way for some of these guys to cash out. It was basically they're mortgaging their future business. And Sillerman saw the opportunity in numbers. He saw that, uh, gee, if every promoter has, you know, whatever it is, uh, five, half million people a year come to their venues to see shows, boy, if I take, put them all together, I have 10 million people coming to shows and I could go to, Co I'm just making these numbers up, by the way, just for illustration, but I could go to Coca-Cola and McDonald's and other major corporations and say, look, my shows get in front of 10 million people, you should advertise with us, you should sponsor our shows, you should sponsor our venues. And he was hoping that that would uh, that the critical mass would mean more, and unfortunately, it really didn't. It right. really didn't. It turned out, first of all, that artists um, have a lot to say about who they want and don't want to sponsor them. Um, that a lot of the marketing was regional and not national at the amphitheaters. Um, it didn't really work to advertise, um, you know, certain. A certain new car or something at the amphitheaters was really much more localized uh, advertising. So the whole concept of that, uh, of of marrying the concert goer with advertising, didn't really work. No, it didn't. But um, so in the process of buying up all these um, promoters, they also inherited in a lot of cases the real estate, the venues, if you will. And that's so, what they're stuck with now. Right. So. Those of you who know anything about real estate is so you have these buildings, these properties, and they're sitting there, and they cost you money. So you've got to figure out how to monetize that, and that means putting shows in there, and hopefully selling a lot of seats. 
so to do that, you have to constantly bring acts in, and sometimes you're going to be stuck paying high fees, or in case you may be aware of overpaying. Well, what also, what also happened a lot is that if shows <clears throat> didn't do well, the promoter said, well, I'll just give the tickets away, because if I have people in the building, at least I'm selling hot dogs and, and beer. But people started to get accustomed to getting free tickets or cheap tickets, and they stopped buying tickets for shows, and it became a spiral effect. So being your own landlord didn't always, uh, it sounds great, oh, I'm my own landlord, I could get all the parking and all, all, the, all the popcorn fees and all the extra things, but sometimes there aren't, it, it, it costs a lot of money to run these venues, and sometimes the extras don't quite add up to what you think. Yes? Uh, yeah, I think we're talking in the abstract. What I think probably be good to um, just give an example of, um, let's say Metallica. Uh, there's going to be a date in two weeks or in two months. Let's put it that way. What happens? The manager calls you and says they want a tour. Or I think they don't know actually the steps of how all that goes on. <coughs> well, and how the artist gets paid. Well, for a tour, I mean, you know, I would be, pl I would start planning for a major tour a year or yeah. so before the tour. Um, but after we discuss how long we want a tour, where we want a tour, what the goal is of the tour, you know, is there a new, is there a new release? Are we promoting something new? Are we have we let, let's say we've been away for a couple of years, we haven't played anywhere, so it's kind of a blank slate of the country. It's a new major artist like Metallica, not a new, I mean, a major artist. So we're going to go play pretty much all the major markets around the country. Um, I will go around and I will literally speak to every major arena and get their calendars, get their schedule. I have to know um, the basketball schedules, the hockey schedules, when the circus is in town, all that stuff. And then I have to uh, route the tour you know, figure out, okay, Boston on Monday, Hartford on Tuesday, New York on Wednesday, Philly on Thursday, and see that everything's available. Contact every venue and hold all the dates and hold a routing. You know, based on every artist has certain, a uh, certain number of miles that they're willing to travel at night, certain number of days in a row they're willing to work, certain days off they need for whatever reasons and, and for production concerns. And so you take all that into account, put together a routing. After I put together a routing, I have to figure out um, who's going to promote the shows in each market, um, how much I, I'm looking for the artist to make, and a lot of that is based on how much I feel I can make out of the market based on a ticket price I feel I could charge and the capacity of the building. And then it's my job to make sure that the expenses of the building, the rent and the unions and the labor and all the expenses that go into running a show to try to bring those costs down as much as possible. The lower the cost, the more my artists make. Um, and I make a deal with the local promoter. The local promoter actually buys or rents, if you will, rents the artist from me for the night, let's say. And I'm the one who figures out how much he or she's going to rent my artist for the night. And how does that work? What, what is the con how does the contract read? Is it a guarantee? It's a guarantee, and then after expenses that I've try to negotiate as low as possible, and there's a back-end money after expenses, and the, and the uh, promoter makes, makes some money back as well. Um, and the goal, you know, the goal is, of course, just to, to find the fair price, ticket price, but a price that you know, covers all the expenses and gets your artist paid, and hopefully some back-end as well. Mm -hmm. Is there a, uh, a break-even point in terms of when in terms of like seventy or eighty percent of the show, I mean it's always it's always different what the break the, the break even is the cost of the artist and the expenses um, when you hit that number and then everything after that, you know you split. Right, but I'm saying like let's say it, it's selling and it's only selling seventy percent for that night or seventy five percent. Is that a, sort of like a break even <coughs> point for the for the promoter or? Uh, if you're doing an arena tour and you're doing 70% business, uh, that's probably, a, you're probably about breaking even, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I would hope to do better than that, but yes. Right. But yes. But so my job, so it's, it's routing, it's literally talking to arenas. It's then talking to the local promoter, 
um, and trying to get as much money as I can for my artists, but in the right situation, the right venue. It's always important for me, for example, to play to sell out. I would much rather an artist sells out a 10,000 seater and people can't get in and you guys, oh man, can you get me a ticket? You can't get in. I'd rather do 10,000 people in a 10,000 seater than do 12,000 people in a 20,000 seater. Yeah, I did 2,000 more people, but I got 8,000 empty seats. Artists won't be happy. The crowd thinks, hey, what am I, how come this place isn't sold out? But that 10,000 seater filled up, filled up with people screaming and yelling, that's, that, that makes it an exciting night, and those people want to come back the next time. So if the promoter wants to say the highest ticket is 100 bucks, and you want it, and you and the manager decide it's gonna be $135 you would like to see. Is there a negotiation then? Uh, well, who was the first person to say 100? The promoter. Promoter says 100, and I say it's 135, it's gonna be 135. <laughs> um, because of the strength of the artist you represent. Yeah, but because of, there's a reason. I'm just not making up that number. I mean, I'm basing it on, the, on what the artist charged last time, how many tickets we sold last time, you know. Keep, keep in mind, Metallica, um, their average ticket price was under $100, about $98. And They're still... 62 cents, according to Pulse. Yeah, it's very important to they were for many years. They want to keep tickets under $100. And some people, that's not, that's not an issue. I mean, every, everyone, everyone has their thresholds. And um, Metallica is a band um, that's been, you know, they've been great to work with. They, they're very promoter friendly. They, uh, they're a band, for example, that doesn't kill for the huge guarantee, but in return, they want the best back end possible, which means it's my job to bring all the expenses down as low as possible, um, because they're not charging you know, the millions of dollars on one side, but they want it on, if they do the business, they want to get paid for it and they deserve it. And you as an agent, get roughly what's the percentage of what <coughs> you get off of gross? Uh, every artist is different. The, the used to be the standard was 10%. Frankly, most superstars don't pay 10%. I'll say that. I wish they did. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a percentage of what the artist earns. Mm -hmm. So the more the artist earns, the more I earn. But again, you have to do it smartly because if you just go for the money, not the career, then you lose in the long run, obviously. Now, when it comes to opening acts and things of that sort, do you use people within your own agency? Or do you have to collaborate with other agencies to get that together? It's always different, uh, but it, but there's always a reason. Um, you know, often it's someone that will enhance the show in some way, um, and the way is, I mean, one way is obviously is just if a band wants to take someone, and that's happening more and more now where the headline is saying, I just want this band, because I like them, or they're cool, or they're my friends, or whatever reason. That, that's one side. Another side is, especially um, changing now, but in quote unquote the olden days, would be a record company would try to convince you to take another act from their label um, with the promise of extra promotion. You know, take, take uh, the so-and-sos with you, and we'll throw in X amount of marketing dollars for the tour, and that might sway a band. Um, could also be a local promoter saying, hey, in my area, this, you should take this band with you because they'll bring an extra 100 people into the room and they'll pay for themselves. So there's, there's always a reason. It's, it's the record company, it's the band, it's the promoter. I, ultimately, you want to pick a band that's going to help you as a headliner sell the most tickets and do the best for your show. Um, you, know, you want someone that is going to enhance the show. You, know, you don't want to just... You don't want to throw, you're not going to throw a spot away, you're not going to, you know, you want it to be, there's, all, there's always a reason, there's always a reason for the opening band. Um, I might try to put some of my bands on my own show, sometimes I don't, it, it causes more problems than it's worth sometimes to put two of my own bands together. Um, but um, there's always, you're always trying to enhance the show. Along the lines of ticket sales, some bands do lotteries first, and they give away a number of tickets for a lower price, and then they do tiered pricing, and after a number of tickets, it gets higher and higher. What's that for, like to create hype, or to know how much you're gonna sell? Well, I think that's really smart, first of all. You've hit on something. Um, 
the concert business has been criticized lately because of Live Nation and AEG, some of the bigger companies, with huge ticket discounting. Um, and what happens is the, the diehard fans of a band, the show goes on sale and people rush out and buy the tickets and then over the next few months, sales slow down, promoter panics, and they start discounting tickets and doing two for ones or whatever. And that starts to devalue the ticket and the people who bought full price tickets are upset. And I think it should be just the opposite. And I think when you first go on sale, if you're gonna discount, if you're gonna think about discounting, do it in the beginning. And the, those fans should be rewarded for buying tickets early and for, you know, for spreading the word also. They have tickets in their hand. They are now an advertisement. I got my tickets. Hey, I'm going to the show. You going to the show? You know? And I see ticket prices should be going up as you get closer to a show, just like airline fares go up, just like hotel rooms prices go up. So I am all about discounting when you first go on sale, not as you get closer to the show. But it's, to answer your question, it's mar I mean, it's, it, it is, it's, it's a marketing ploy, is what it is. And who looks bad? Hmm. Well, I think fans look good if they're offering a discount to their fans when they first go on sale. No, I meant, but the way it's been going. Oh, it makes the bands look horrible. Yeah. Um, and, and the promoters look horrible. I mean, this past summer, um, to be at a show um, that you've paid $100 a ticket for, or $50 a ticket, whatever it is, and to maybe have tickets to another concert in two weeks, but then see someone at the venue with a washboard offering $10 for, that, for those tickets, um, that's no fair. I mean, hey, I paid 100 bucks for that concert, now you're selling them for 10 bucks. That's that. That's not a way to gain trust to get to for a corporation to gain consumer trust. Well, record companies tried that a couple of times, where the the initial release of an album, and then three weeks later they had two more cuts. So they're taking the best fan who went out and bought it that day. He short three cuts or whatever the hell. The right. That's was. that's not. If you treat your fans poorly, they right. you know they don't come back. And what, now we're on the same subject. What about all the convenience fees and the and the all the fees that the artist doesn't take part in? Uh, I don't know if they don't take part in them. Um, uh, well, but yes, I mean you know, with everyone, with people trying to get the best deals possible. So now there's uh, less less pieces of the pie to to cut up, so people create more pie, and so venue says, okay, well. You knock down my rent, but it's three bucks a ticket facility fee because of some renovation we're going to do or whatever it is, and and convenience charges and Ticketmaster mailing fees and handling charges. Yes, there are the the, the charges are out of hand, no doubt about it. You know, a, a twenty or thirty forty dollar ticket could cost you an extra, could cost you fifty percent more. You know, I wish I had more control over that, but I don't. So um, let's look at the, anyone want to guess, uh, 2010 Polestar, the um, top grossing concert tour, uh, which artist that might be? Gaga. Pardon? Gaga. No. 2010. You guys had it on a quiz, you Jovi. I'm sorry, did I hear somebody say something over there? Bon Jovi, $200 Correct. Million. Right. Um, Followed by number two is ACDC, followed by number three U2, number four is Lady Gaga, and his client Metallica at number five, with the average ticket price as I referenced, uh, was it uh, ninety-eight dollars and seventy-two cents, and the uh, average amount of tickets at each venue sold was about twenty-six thousand five hundred, and um, what you did they. It's a low number, but they pulled it off with doing, what, um, 42 cities, 60 shows. That's not a lot globally for the year. No, that was, that's, I believe, just U.S. Oh, that's worldwide? That's yeah. worldwide, okay. Yeah. So, and you guys book them worldwide? Not, no, North America only. Oh. Well, you got credit for everything. Polestar. <laughs> it just goes to show you can't believe everything you read. So Billy Joel around uh, worldwide, Rod Stewart worldwide, uh, Lincoln Park worldwide, except Europe, but most other artists just North America, meaning Canada, Mexico, and U.S. So I pulled this quote out, which I also found was interesting. 
um, about live music. Let's see if I can uh, figure it out here. That um, live music is one of the few businesses in which secondhand goods often sell for more than new ones. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine going to an automotive dealer and saying, I want to buy a two year old car, but I'm going to pay more for that than the new model from this year? Secondhand goods. Now, I know that's probably not the most valid analogy, but think about that. You're going to pay more for something that was already bought once. You're going to pay for it again. You're paying more than for a new one. Yes, sir? It, it seems like ticket prices are more like collector's items than actual merchandise. If you look at comic books or, or really old video games or something like that, you see that like Detective Comics number one, it, it sells for millions. and. Like the first appearance of Superman, something like that, like monumentous, which sells her multi millions, and seeing a rare opportunity like uh, a re like another tour of, of Queen or something, people that would if all the tickets are sold out and there's only that one left, just like that one last comic book, it's gonna sell out like that. So valid point. So you're saying it's coming like a collector's market. Yeah, it's like it exactly to see that experience. It's there. It's only going to happen that one time, and if there's only that one comic book, it's going to be worth that much. The, the only difference is once that one comic book's gone, it's gone. There's no more. Yeah. Um, but unless they get, I guess they could reprint them, well, as a lot of them do. But chances are Billy Joel's going to be back. Well, bad example, but uh, <laughs> chances are Metallica will be yeah. back the following year. Um, so there's opportunities to re, to enjoy that experience at a later date, but maybe it's not the same, because maybe it's a different venue, maybe it's a different uh, yeah. song set. Um, I, I just, you know, it speaks to the whole um, concept of the, you know, the scalpers, uh, you know, the stub hubs of the world where um, things are going for an additional price. And and to your thing, why why should StubHub be making money uh, selling Metallica tickets if somebody's willing to pay more than the ninety-eight dollars and they're willing to pay two hundred dollars, and why shouldn't Metallica get it? Metallica should get the money, absolutely. Right, but then the problem becomes if it's a two hundred dollar ticket, there's always going to be some schmo out there who's going to pay four hundred dollars, and it's it's I guess it it's what I guess you said the auction might be the more equitable arrangement. It's like let the market seek uh, its own level. The only thing is then, as you pointed out. You're sitting in an airplane, and the guy next to you is paying maybe half the fare. But you don't know that. You don't know that. That's right. But inevitably, people talk. And I've been on planes where people say, what would you pay for your ticket? And you know, people get really annoyed. At some point, I guess, I guess at some point that backfires, although um, when you're dealing with a commodity such as entertainment, there's a you know, perceived value that people are going to be, no, I wanted to see it on this date, and here's why as opposed to, I guess, an airline flight where you could take that flight an hour later or an hour earlier. Does somebody back there have a question? Oh, oh yes, I was sir. just going to say that um, calling it secondhand kind of like hides the fact that if people aren't paying more for a secondhand item, they're paying more for a sold out item, which is basically that if all the, like, if all the Wii's sold out, Point. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't be saying, like, why are people paying more for secondhand Wii's? You'd understand that they're paying more for something that they couldn't get otherwise. Point taken. Point taken. <laughs> and I'm, th I'm thankful that I'm in a business that, you know, can't be replicated, that the live experience is a one-time thing, and that's, that's what we try to sell. Um, and while the record business and other parts of the industry are suffering uh, from a monetary standpoint, thankfully the live business people still want to see the live show. Um, and while you say that Metallica may come back more than once in their career, between now and the end of their career, when they come, it's still once every few years. It's still special. It's still for those fans. And I know that the artists that I'm excited about, when they come, I'm excited about and I want to go. And, and it's very special. And I want to I wanna memorialize that experience. So I, I'm going to, while I'm there, I'm going to buy that T-shirt because that helps That's me. That's a big part of the business now. Right. So when you say it's a big part of the business, how big a part of the business is it? Oh, it's huge. I mean, there are artists now that forget about what they're selling online uh, and what they're selling in stores, and, 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 but at the actual show, um, there are bands that could do 
20 25 dollars a head in merchandise you know so if you have 10,000 people spending 25 dollars a head it adds up you know and if you do 50 nights a year I mean merchandise could be really huge um, a major a major pop star a, a Lady Gaga type of artist does probably close to $25 or more a night uh, per person so just like food in an airport why is it more expensive I can buy that I can buy a t-shirt for a lot less but it doesn't have the premium added value I agree but why is a t-shirt thirty forty dollars because you want to buy it there you want to have it that minute but I you're, know first of all, I have nothing to do with it I mean I'm not the one pricing it no no but, 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 but you're but it's part and it's, parcel it's the value it's because it's what the value is of but, but the band isn't making I mean they're not making the whole value they're of that smart they are but there's somebody else participating in that profit well, well, someone else has to. I mean, isn't, isn't the venue isn't make the, the promoter, shirts and print the shirts? But isn't, and isn't the promoter and the venue sharing in the in the split on the on sales of merch? Yes. Right. Yeah, a small a small percentage, but yes, it's small. With the venue. Yeah. Yeah, but, but MSG started with the forty percent <coughs> uh, on their merch deals, if I'm not mistaken, and I always try to tell people that I think. MSG deserves the highest percentage there is because if you're a out of towner and you go to MSG, that's the biggest arena in the world. Yeah, I don't know what they're. I mean, every building's deal is different. Uh, the Garden has horrible deals on everything just because of union costs, yeah, and sure. you know, they're the hardest. Uh, they're the most expensive building in the world, and it's not just because they choose to be. It's because that they physically are. Because to just to open the doors. You have to have a certain amount of union people here, there, and, and it just it costs you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, literally, to open the door at Madison Square Garden every day. Somebody else had a question over there? No? Um, so when, when SFX consolidated and it became, um, when it became uh, you know, Live Nation, um, and they had difficulty filling all these venues, as they still do, have a lot of, you know, empty rooms um, on a nightly basis. It's just impossible to fill out all that real estate. There's just not a big enough talent pool, nor is there an economic support system. So they decided maybe there's other ways to make money. So we added parking and administrative fees, as you, as you pointed out, and all those wonderful things that everybody gets annoyed about. But then they looked around and said, wait a minute. So hmm, one of the big things here is, is the tickets. How about we get involved with tickets? And why don't we consolidate our businesses and not only control the venues, and hopefully not, but they determine sometimes the fees they pay the talent, but let's also be responsible for the distribution and setting up selling the tickets. So they got, they got in bed and... Um, well, it's a huge, the ticketing business is a huge business that kind of went under the radar for years until people realized, wait a second, there's a couple guys making all this money on ticketing and we should get involved in ticketing. So it's a huge, it's not just concerts, it's everything. Tickets to everything. It was so started by some college students, I think, in Arizona back in the late 60s, I think. What, Ticketron was? There were, or Ticketmaster, Ticketron. Um, so, so now you have <clears throat> one company uh, parenthetically controlling the, the distribution or access to the tickets, as well as controlling the venues, or the, the premier venues. So, and the government approved that with the understanding that they had to push off one of their divisions that sort of was not crucial to it. And now, from what I understand, their Live Nation's competitor, if that's the right word, AEG, has aligned themselves with a different ticketing distribution company, which was started by the guy that was running Ticketmaster before. Yeah, I, I think the fear is, for AG standpoint, that if Live Nation owns a ticketing company and they sell tickets to our shows, to AEG shows, that they're gonna know too much about our business. They're gonna know how much we're charging. They're gonna know how much we're making, meaning, meaning Live Nation is going to know how much AEG is making on shows. And it really doesn't work that way. It really is two separate businesses that it sounds like, oh, gee, we'll just, you know, 
have an advantage and will know everything about every ticket buyer, but they're not sophisticated enough to figure that out. Who's they? I mean, Ticketmaster and Live Nation are, wouldn't even be sophisticated enough to figure out how to use their information if they knew how to harvest it. <laughs> I, but, uh, but access to their access to their database uh, there is none it's it's so there's so many firewalls in between one and the other and you can't just like press some button and find find everyone so the the divvy, as far as i know the divvying up of the assets um it's interesting aeg uh controls a lot aeg controls a lot of european venues um they're very heavily involved in in sports um and and sports venues um, so, they own uh, a couple of NHL franchises. Um, they own some sports teams overseas in, in England, um, in Sweden. Um, I think they have a controlling share of the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, they have their own merchandising company. Um, they run venues too. They run Staples Center. They run the Sprint Center in Kansas City. They run. You know, the, all venues all over the all over the place, soccer stadiums. Now, are these venues exclusive to either Live Nation no. or AEG? No. So, if if you and I wanted to put a concert on, we could, assuming we get the the the, the assets together and the financing, we could go to one of those venues. They're not because they want to fill. They the will place. be happy to take your money. Yes. <laughs> happy to take our money. Okay. Um, and so the two key players here, um, the AEG is privately held. Uh, I don't know if I pronounce his name right, Philip An Anschutz. An Anschutz. And the guy who's running um, uh, Live Nation, uh, Constable Rapino, Rapino, Michael Rapino. And then he, account he reports to, I guess, um, the company that owns. Live Nation and Ticketmaster in front line. Yeah, to be honest, the whole board, and I don't know who's who, and I don't even, it changes too often to even worry about it. So it, it doesn't impact what you do on a day to day basis. No. I mean, it may dribble down over a period of time, though. Uh, well, the business is always changing, so yes. But, uh, you know, it's also, listen, it's also an artist-driven business. And my artists, you know, if Billy Joel wants to play a certain venue or wants to be uh, uh, presented in a certain way in a certain city in a certain venue, that's my job to get it done, and I'll get it done no matter, I mean, I've got to do it. <laughs> so no matter who's running the building or who's promoting. It, it, it's Sil uh, Silverman have the idea that, that we could cut out the booking agent? Uh, if he owned all the promoters. He, the I'm sure he thought that to himself, but he quickly realized that it's a really is a relationship based business, and that uh, the agents have relationships with the artists, and in fact the artists want the intermediary of an agent in between themselves and the promoter. Mm -hmm. They want someone like myself overseeing the deal and looking out for them. I mean, the way a lawyer would look over a contract before you bought a piece of real estate or whatever it is, right. that's what I'm doing. I'm making sure that the artist isn't getting screwed. Well, did he feel that the manager could do that, take that role on? Um, yes and no, but the artists, again, didn't want to see that happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was... He was brilliant because he ran the stock up, I think, to about sixty dollars a share when he sold the business. Oh, he's you know he's always he's right. like a stock play guy. You know, he's got a new stock he's trying to do now. Yeah. Um, his last one unfortunately didn't work well. He took um, the assets of Graceland and Muhammad Ali um, and Nineteen Management, which is the company that handles American Idol and manages all those entities and put together a company and unfortunately it didn't do what he wanted it to do so he bailed and he's starting another um, property. But I, w I was wondering if you ever run into a situation because you're still an independent company um, that you find yourself you know, at your wit's end trying to find the right venue in the right time because Live Nation has their agenda and they're supporting some 
uh, tours of artists that they um, have management on? They, listen, Live Nation will certainly try to uh, sway things to certain buildings and uh, sometimes they might convince me and sometimes they might not. And again, there's reasons. But ultimately, if my artist gets there and it's not the right venue for whatever reason, and I get that phone call the next morning, why'd you put me here when you should have put me there? I never want to have that phone call. So I make sure I don't have that phone call by putting my artist in the right venue. I go to sleep at night knowing I'm not going to get that phone call. You know, I don't want to get the phone Oh, I know you just put it in the, you know, in the amphitheater in this city because Live Nation wanted to, but the arena is a much better place and we would have done better. Well, if I thought that they would have been at the arena. Um, I believe last, <coughs> I guess last summer, one of the um, <coughs> hot tickets, if you were, was the Carol King James Taylor tour. And I'm hearing rumblings and rumors that, that, that the big tour <clears throat> now for that same demographic is going to be um, the Rod Stewart, Stevie Nicks tour. You guys book Rod, and Stevie has always been a frontline slash now Live Nation artist. I wonder how that dynamic works for you <clears throat> or against you. No, we, uh, when we, we were talking to a few artists, we were trying to put together a package for Rod. Um, the idea was always to have a co-headliner type of artist, and there were two or three that we were talking to, and, um, and it worked out with Stevie, and it's a great, uh, actually the tour was supposed to start two nights ago, it actually, can't, we canceled the first night, unfortunately, in Florida, Rod is sick, and it's a tough way to start a tour by canceling the first night. But um, they'll be in New York next week, um, hopefully. But it was really, it was really just about creating a bigger show, you know, uh, a believing that one plus one equals three, that there are some Rod Stewart fans, some Stevie Nicks fans, but some people that would see both together and go, oh wow, this is like, this, this is a show that I should go see, and it's we've been proven right. So, it, it, uh, a few weeks ago, it reported what. Live Nation did with acquisitions in uh, 2010, and most of them were buying pieces of management companies. Oh, yes. Is Irving trying to consolidate almost like what Silverman tried to do in terms of promoters? I, I think, but I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if they know what they're doing. I don't know. <coughs> I, I, I believe what you're saying is he's, he's viewed that model and said, why not? I mean, almost overnight, the national management scene has, the landscape's changed instantaneously because um, Frontline, under Irving's direction, has really gone on there and, and you know, um, made some significant um, purchases with the management companies. And much like the concert promoters who, you know, mortgaging futures, same deal. Going to give you X amount of cash up front, and when you recoup that amount of money in, in bookings, and, and revenue earned, then you know we we you know you'll get shares and a participation in a, in a bigger entity. Now whether that'll work, but you know think about the the synergistic efforts there. I mean where they can you know go and, and do crazy stuff with you know controlling the venue and the management and the ticketing. Um, the only thing missing is an audio output. And at some point, you would think they would get involved, uh, or maybe, or maybe they're smart enough not to get involved in owning a, 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 a recording company. <coughs> well, I think that was <clears throat> part of their 360 deal idea was to have a record company. But well, so yeah, so one of the things Live Nation did up until recently, um, under the direction of a guy named Michael Cole, was launched, um, I guess for a better term, Live Nation Records, and. They signed Madonna. Um, they Jay signed, Z. pardon? Jay Z. Jay Z. Um, U two. Okay. You, no, U two. They only signed for um, touring. Um, it's that Canadian band. Um, uh, anyway, there's quite there's quite Nickelback. a Shakira, <laughs> Nickelback, Shakira. There's there's a bunch of them. And when things started going south, that went away. But they still have these these deals in place. What I wanted to say to you is Michael Cole is one of the players. Um, he's, a, he's a Canadian concert promoter named Michael Cole. And he pioneered what I believe was buying a national tour. 
Well, he, the way, the way I talk about Frank Barcelona before revolutionizing the agency business and creating a network of independent promoters, Michael Cole created the mega concert. Um, he was the one who uh, the first Rolling Stones, I don't even know what, uh, Steel Wheels or whatever, the first big, big production show. I think at the time, and it's a small amount now compared to the value of tours, but I think he offered the Stones $50 million uh, for X amount of shows um, in the late 80s, I, or early 80s, I don't even know when it was, to be honest. But um, I don't think Michael Cole even had access to $50 million when he made the deal. But uh, it worked out in his favor, and he created, you know, the mega stages, the mega productions, <coughs> which has now turned into the U2 tours he does also, and, and of course, Spider-Man now, and, 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 and that fiasco. But it's always, always big, huge phantasmagoras. But he's locked out a lot of people having other opportunities because he's controlled that. In other words, um, if you're a local promoter or had any aspirations of booking U2, um, he just bought the whole package, and he controls their live performance globally now. Because yes. he's, pro he's promised them one big fat number that he will get to at the end. And so merchandise, everything falls under him, and he's promised them this big check. And that's something that, the, that you two obviously wants and is comfortable with. And, and you know, he, he presented them an option that they went for. And there are some people that, that go for that. There are people that that want the big check and, and, or want it all under one umbrella, and that's fine, but just know what you're getting into. So it curiously speaks to what we started this conversation with uh, an hour or so ago, is um, so you have all these big acts with these amazing deals, um, national tours promise, and you wonder where is the development? You know, you used to start a club, and you built yourself up to a small theater, and hopefully eventually became an arena act. And those opportunities seem to be fewer and fewer because the ideas. No, they're still, there, they're still there, but they're still there. But it's different people doing it. It's not Live Nation or AG that's doing. You again have to get to a point. You know, Lady Gaga did a whole tour before Live Nation came along. It was a, it was a, the tour was a wreck, and there were people involved. It, it got, it got better when Live Nation took over, actually, and 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 fixed Lady Gaga's touring, if you will. Um, so in that case, it was a very positive thing. Yes. Um, and none of this information... From my, I don't represent, I have nothing to do with Lady Gaga, but from an outside, from, from looking, from an outside <coughs> looking in, it seemed that they kind of straightened things out. Of course, none of this has anything to do, we haven't even discussed, um, and neither one of us probably have the necessary background, but for both the, con the country con uh, concert business and the uh, hip-hop urban business, it's a totally different dynamics, different players, different venues, different marketing opportunities. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess the, you know, the mini Michael Cole might be this guy, Al Heyman, <coughs> on, on the urban side, where he'll buy out the entire Little Wayne tour, and then maybe he'll get in bed with um, Live Nation and uh, book dates. Um, and, you know, um, that marketplace, though, is much more uh, transient and, and, and fickle. I mean, uh, you know, um, there are very few hip-hop artists that will have the length of a career of a Rod Stewart, and that's another whole um, dynamic. Um, you know, but again, you know, Rod Stewart will sell X, but the hysteria surrounding um, a Little Wayne tour, um, you know, overshadows that. Um, so it's very important that hip-hop, that those explosive shows that come out of nowhere and, you know, you have to really maximize those dates and make, make your money and not get ripped off. You really need people around you that know about how much it costs to put on a show and know the expenses and know how to bring those costs down so it's not just a runaway train of, of, of money getting, getting wasted. And then again, I should point out that AEG does buy out tours. Um, they're, they're the, um, I believe they're the exclusive promoters of Bon Jovi yeah. and um, I think they would do Taylor Swift too. I think that was yep. one of theirs. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts were. Um, you see this happening uh, in, in Las Vegas a lot, these artist residencies where an artist will just camp out and, and play several months um, in, in, one, in one venue. Uh, how does that work? Well, 
you know, I don't think any of us know what it's really like to be on the road um, for any great length of time. But um, Metallica, for example, it's a three-year international tour. And they are playing every corner of the planet, literally. And it sounds great. It sounds romantic. It's, oh, my God, these guys get to go to all these cool cities. You know, yes and no. I mean, they fly in. They get there in the middle of the night. They wake up to do the show. They get on another plane. They go somewhere else. They don't even get to see the cities they're in half the time. If you're an artist, if you're someone like Celine Dion that's been around the world a bunch of times and toured everywhere and waking up and going to bed in all these strange hotels and everything, and someone comes up to you and go, here's X amount of millions of dollars to never have to get on a plane for a year, you know? It's tempting to some people. So some people want to stay in one place. And in Las Vegas, so Celine Dion and other people, they get themselves a beautiful home outside of town and they uh, play in one venue and it's marketed and it becomes, it becomes, you know, the only place to see that artist for a while. And I have no problem with it if that's what some if that's something someone wants to do, whether it's Vegas or somewhere else. Um, I mean, it's what Michael Jackson was going to do in London was going to be was the same was the same principle. So I don't see anything wrong with it if that's what someone wants to do. I mean, does it kind of does it cheapen you? Does it make you? I mean, you know, maybe. But uh, uh, Celine Dion or Cher or Bed Midler or three people that have done it in Vegas. Their careers are as big or bigger than they were when they first did it. So it's just another opportunity. Just another opportunity, absolutely. Do you they, see... They use a booking agent for that? Yes, yes, that yes. I mean, Rod Stewart, for example, is has a small deal in Vegas. It's, uh, it's uh, we did two weeks last year. It's going to be, I think, four weeks this year. But yeah, we negotiated and absolutely. Um, is it a similar situation where, um, I guess... <laughs> The one that comes to mind is Branson, Missouri. It's just the same thing, just on a smaller scale? Yeah, Branson, you know, again, I have, I don't know if I've ever had an artist play Branson. It's not my, my artists right. don't, don't play there, but it's, it's, uh, it's a, uh, Branson, Missouri is a small town of theaters. Uh, we're a bunch of old, uh, older country acts, um, and not just country, country western, and, and uh, play, uh, Extended runs, um, you know, again appeals to an audience. You know, also an, another audience we didn't talk about, for example, is is Christian music, which is another huge, huge business. Um, again, you have any of those? Uh, well, we actually just represent. We just signed a band called Red, which right. is right. Uh, a happening Christian rock band um, that you know they will play. They'll play clubs on their own. But then, as part of a Christian tour, they'll play in front of twenty thousand people in an arena. It's interesting, and they'll do, you know, it's kind of like a radio show. They'll do like five songs, and there's like five bands doing five songs each for these for these shows. And they play a lot of the traditional arenas, but again, they're marketed by different by by Christian promoters who know how, where to promote, where to you know uh, market the shows, and it's a whole di and and they're after you know there's sometimes two shows or three shows a day. It's two p.m. and five p.m you know, shows instead of 8 p.m. shows. Um, it's a whole so, different so world. No, no disrespect intended, but why would Red go with you guys? You're a secular agency, or are they trying they to break out? They actually have two. They actually oh, so have, they have a Christian agent? They have a Christian agent and a rock agent. So you're, so right. you're, the, you're, the, you're the rock agent, obviously. Yes, yes. And so, and so you just coordinate, so you're not, um, you're not con con confli conflicting there. Um, what about Broadway? Um, I've had artists, in fact, when I represented Joan Jett, she played Broadway. Um, it's extremely expensive. Uh, it's, it's a great opportunity, but you have to play. Broadway theaters can only be rented by the week. You can't do one show. You have to, you have to be able to do eight shows just to, to make it financially feasible. <coughs> so that's why you don't see many people do that. Um, here's one for you. So Live Nation, whether you agree with it philosophically or not, signed to put on a tour together, to tour for Charlie Sheen. And they put two dates on sale. I think it was Detroit and Chicago. And they broke records as far as you know, Ticketmaster, how quickly those venues sold out. So now there's maybe another 30, 40 dates 
Um, so whatever your personal thoughts are on Charlie Sheen for a second, I mean, they're going to have a, a rocking tour here that's going to sell out. It's a huge tour, and it's a real score for them. Um, <clears throat> and it's, you know, listen, I am a huge believer, obviously, as someone who represents artists and people who make music and people who are artistic. I'm a huge believer in freedom of speech. Um, and, for example, I represent Ted Nugent, who is the most uh, right-wing uh, Republican uh, Gun-toting. Gun-toting artist that there is. Um, I may disagree with virtually everything he says, but he has the right to say it. And I will admit that he says it quite eloquently and believes very passionately, um, has very passionate beliefs. Uh, and Charlie Sheen, on the other, in another side of that, you know, uh, who am I to judge? Um, no, but I, I mean, so kudos to them for pulling this <coughs> off. Um, I guess the funny part of it all is they really don't know what the show is going to be. Yeah, I'm told together. it's going to be uh, you know him sitting on a couch. That he's writing material now. Um, Although that was never his forte to be. He wasn't a writer. Yeah, but he's an actor. Right. So he'll be able to. If someone writes something for him, he'll pull it off. He'll. He could. He's. He's an actor. So he's again. He's a good actor. So he'll. He could. I think he could pull it off. No, he de no, he definitely will. But they sold out a tour. Now they got to figure out what the tour is. Well, I that happened to me as well once. Um, I represented. I did the Dirty Dancing tour, which was a tour based on the movie, back in I think 1988. That was, um, and uh, we created this tour, but didn't know what the tour was. We just we just knew that we had one of the hottest properties, and if we said the Dirty Dancing tour, and we got a couple people from the soundtrack to go on tour with us, we could create something. So we rented out a uh, rehearsal room at Radio City Music Hall, you know, one of the, with the mirror and the, the, the ballerina bar or whatever it's called. And we got all the press in and we announced this tour and we, had, uh, we hired Kenny Ortega at the time to do the uh, choreography. And we had Kenny Ortega in the room. We, we hired like these 15 dancers to put their legs up on the, on the beam and pretend that they were rehearsing a, uh, uh, a scene from the Dirty Dancing show. Anyway, did the press conference. Uh, we went on sale with the show. We sold out eight nights at Radio City Music Hall, eight shows. And we're like, OK, we got to put a show together. So we put a show together. And um, we got uh, Eric Carmen And we, got, uh, we actually got the contours who sang, uh, uh, do, you do You Love Me? Literally, the Contours hadn't been together in 10 years, and literally one of the guys in the band was a garbage man in Detroit. And we had to hire him away from being a sanitation man to come rejoin the band and go on tour. And it was a huge tour. So yes, yeah, well, you can. I hope he didn't have to go back to that. Sorry? I hope he didn't have to go back to that. I, I don't know <laughs> what happened after the tour, but. It was it was a good it was a good two year two year tour. So that speaks of the of the Glee tour or the Ninja Turtles tour. I mean these are you know events. Um, the the other event stuff you're involved in. You guys uh, book or represent tennis? Yeah, we actually just started. Uh, it's called um, Ch Tennis Champion Series. It's going to be this fall. We're going to do twelve tennis uh, tournaments around the country. It will be televised. It's um, it's Andre. It's 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 basically like an all-star tennis, uh, um, in, a, a um, retired tennis players. It's it's McEnroe, Agassi, um, Jim Courier, and someone else. I'm forgetting right now. Sampras. Sam Pete Sampras. Yes, exactly. And they're they'll be fighting for money and uh, for prize money, and and we're gonna sell it. Listen, Andre Agassi and Pete Sampras, they're, in, in their world, they're rock stars. So the marketing will be similar to what we do for, for a rock show. They just did one, right? At the Garden, yes. Yes, I remember seeing that was a one. That was a one-night thing. Now we're going to do 12 cities in the yeah. fall and make it into a, uh, into a real tournament. Um, over the years, you must have had some uh, disappointments. 
there something that the, something that got away from you uh, that you were trying to sign, or was this a, a tour or a show that smelled to you like a, a, a runaway train success and didn't? Well, I mean, there's always bands that people, you know, say, come out and see. You don't come out and see them, and they become huge. And you're like, gee, maybe if I went to that show, I could have signed the band. But as far as regrets tour-wise, not really. I mean, um, have I, I don't know if I've been involved in no any, turkeys. Any, any real turkeys. How about surprises, things that you weren't, you were a little skeptical of and uh, you were pleasantly surprised and it became a big deal? Um, <coughs> I am, I have, I am often, I'll tell you right now what shocked me, right? Uh, just a real pleasant surprise, another artist that I haven't talked about who uh, uh, we represent, and we represented them now for well over 10 years, and that's Ramstein. I was, I was going to bring that one up. <laughs> and How many are familiar with Ramstein? <coughs> they so they hadn't played here in 10 years. And so we finally, we brought them to the Garden, the, the two shows, Montreal and the Garden. Um, and we could actually, we could not find a promoter in New York to do Ramstein. <laughs> Every single promoter, not just Live Nation and AEG, but Live Nation, AEG, national people, local people, people from other cities, secondary promoters. We asked everyone to do the show. Everyone thought we were nuts. So, but we had an artist demanding to play the garden. And we knew in our hearts that it was there, that there was something there. We didn't know how big, but we knew that we could, we would do well there. So we got the garden on board with us to actually promote the show. The garden actually promoted the show. <clears throat> wow. And it sold out in less than 30 minutes. Now here's the crazy thing. After it sold out, 30 minutes, and Montreal sold out in 15 minutes. So now we call Live Nation again. Okay. <laughs> you saw what happened? Want to do some more shows? Eh, maybe, I don't know. Well, no, no, nothing too risky. How about Los Angeles? How about Chicago? How about Toronto? Just a couple of big, major, major markets. They all passed. Everyone, they looked like, nah, yeah, New York's New York, Montreal's Montreal. That's uh, one thing, but that doesn't mean it's going to be big in Chicago. It doesn't mean it's going to, whatever, whatever. One thing led to another. We finally found a champion at Live Nation, the Live Nation touring. Um, someone who's actually involved with on the uh, on the U2 and Stone side actually from from <coughs> Toronto, and they're doing ten shows, including uh, the Meadowlands, uh, uh, Izod Center, which is almost sold out. That's in May, um, and every it basically is sold out. And every other show is about eighty five percent business. About I mean huge. The band's going to make millions of dollars. Huge, hugely successful tour. But it also shows that people, you know, sometimes they're not really tuned into what's going on. And if I'm not mistaken, their production is pretty lavish. It's, it's awesome. I and mean, if any of you guys are going to have the chance to go to the show in May, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a lot of pyrotechnics. A lot of pyrotechnics and very creatively done. And uh, it's cool. It's cool. And only one song in English, the rest in German. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it does not matter at all. It's to, awesome. To Hest. Um, what about the one that got away? You know, I mean, I, you know, years ago, I got a phone call from a friend, you know, hey, you should come down here and see this band. Uh, they're playing Virginia, Dave Matthews, and I didn't go. Someone else did, and he signed them. I didn't. That doesn't mean I would have signed it if I went, right. but I had the opportunity, you know, but everyone has that opportunity. Everyone has those stories of bands that they could have, should have. But uh, the, the, the Ramstein story. But the Ramstein, the Ramsteins make up for it. Another one, yeah, absolutely. That's, pretty, that's a pretty uh, unique uh, situation. I remember when they announced the Garden, people were scratching their heads, and I went, "No, I think that's going to work." We actually had a deal that if we were so wrong with this, 
that if after two weeks we hadn't sold 5,000 tickets, the garden had the right to cancel the show, we had sold 5,000 tickets less than five minutes. Literally, literally. It was, it was, that was a very, that was a fun Saturday to uh, be monitoring the, the ticket counts. I'll bet. A um, couple of hot tours you have coming up. Uh, the, the Poison reunion tour. Poison, well, Poison and Motley Crue together this summer. Uh, there's one tour, uh, Def Leppard and Heart together this summer. Yep. Sticks and Yes this summer. Um, Meatloaf is touring this summer. Uh, Rush is touring this summer, or part of the summer. So you have a busy, busy summer. And there's always the question of I know it's all classic rock and kind of boring, but. Uh, and there's always the question of Billy, what Billy's going to do. Billy will tour. Um, he had some surgery, uh, some hip surgery a few months ago, and uh, I think where some people might anticipate feeling 100%, and then he wants to be 100% mentally, and then he'll go tour. I'm sure he's close. He's close. Next year. Next year, because he's got, he's got the movie, came out on DVD. He's got the live album with the DVD, different DVD out, mm -hmm. and I guess the bio comes out in June. And yeah. His, his book. Yes. And then culminate next year in a tour. I'm, I'm, I am hopeful. hopeful that we'll see him next year. Oh, another interesting act you have, um, him. Yeah, no, him's been a great act, and uh, um, you know, again, we signed them. Uh, they were definitely making noise in Europe, but not here yet. And uh, and it's been a it's been a good it's been a good. Uh, and the opposite end of the spectrum, you have Kenny G. <laughs> <laughs> that that is definitely the other end of the spectrum. Um, but it's okay because he uh, keeps us exposed to something to some things that we may not. Uh, some sides of, of, of the concept of the pop rock business that we may not uh, uh, be exposed to with some of our other artists. For example, the corporate side, the, the corporate business is something Kenny does a lot of, and that's, that's good to keep us into that business and know what's going on with, with private and corporate events. Well, it's quite, it's quite an eclectic uh, roster and uh, must be a lot of fun. Um, just, you know, from, from you know, Kenny, Kenny G to Rammstein. It's, uh, it's showbiz. So anybody have any uh, questions before um, we thank? Yes, sir. How long have you been managing or uh, doing the work for Lincoln Park? Uh, since before they were called Lincoln Park. Before they were called Lincoln Park. So you're behind basically Every project revolution I've been to. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Mulcarney had mentioned that your when you were at Syracuse, music management was your minor. What was your major? There was no major. There was no music industry major. What I did at Syracuse actually um, was I created a major. They had the opportunity then, it was something called Selected Studies, where I had to write a paper to justify what I wanted to learn and how I was going to learn it. And I put together a music industry major um, from a business side. I wasn't technical at all, so I had nothing to do with turning knobs or playing an instrument. I know nothing about that. Um, but I combined the music industry minor courses that were for musicians to go out in the world and not get screwed in the business world. Take the minor, and I combined it with uh, TV, radio, and advertising courses from the Newhouse School of Communications, and combined it with a couple of management courses from the management school. Wrote a paper saying why this is a great thing for me, and somebody bought it, and luckily it worked out for me, because uh, here you are. Here I am. <laughs> Frankly, it probably didn't prepare me for anything except what I'm doing, so I'm lucky that I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> true words, true words. Dr. Marconi. Do you see Live Nation imploding at all between Irving and, and Michael, and they got rid of Barry Diller already? 
Well, I don't know if they know what they're doing. I think they're really mixed up. But they do have a ticketing system that works. Whether we like it or not, it works. We do, they do have real estate, um, for better or for worse. Meaning they have these amphitheaters in cities um, that they either have to fill. They have to fill. They have no choice. Um, so I mean, they'll, they'll be around. It's just, but it's going to be changing. It's going to be changing because new bands are going to come up and Live Nation is not going to, it's going to present them. And other people are. And then other people are going to have the potential to grow with those bands and keep those. Some of those bands will jump to Live Nation. If they, it always happens. But some bands will stick with the local guy and, uh, and will grow with them. It's true. I, just, I mean, I never met Irving. Maybe you did. But I, from what I know of him, I don't know how he could answer the Michael. Continue to answer the mic. Uh, he's not, Michael's going to answer to him. Right. His his motto, Irving, is either I win or I win. <laughs> <laughs> and I would tell you never ever bet against him because mm -hmm. he, he's he's the he's the smartest guy and pretty arguably right now one of the most powerful people in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. Yep. And not afraid of anything or saying anything. I mean, there's no filter. Well, thank you, Adam. Thanks for coming. Not Appreciate you making the trip. Thank you.